Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Regulation of mRNA Translation by Ribosomes. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. I am Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Vincent Morrow, PhD. Dr. Morrow is Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer for Chromosome and an Adjunct Associate Professor at the Scripps Research Institute. I will now turn it over to Dr. Morrow for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I'd like to thank Lab Roots and Bioconference Live for this, for this opportunity. Um, so, uh, translation, uh, as, we, as we all know, is one of the most highly conserved mechanisms in, in biology. Uh, the genetic code is essentially universal, except for a few exceptions. The translation machinery is highly conserved across kingdoms uh, to ribosomal subunits. The, the components, RNA and protein, the aspects of the ribosomes are are even very, very similar, even from E. coli to human. And the, the, kind of the importance of translation is, is in synthesizing proteins and kind of in uh, translating the genetic code. But there, there's another aspect to ribosomes, which until the last few years wasn't, wasn't well appreciated, which is a regulatory aspect. And so that, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about in, in this presentation. So I'll, I'll begin with a little background on translation initiation and on ribosomes. I'll discuss the ribosome filter hypothesis, which uh, has postulated the, the regulatory role of, of ribosomes. And then I'll give a few examples from, from our lab, uh, primarily on uh, interactions um, affecting specific regulation through ribosomal RNA. And I'll, I'll touch on a few other examples which highlight some, some important uh, variants of the, uh, of the notion of ribosomal regulation. And, and at the end, uh, I'll, I'll just touch on um, maybe some of the more synthetic aspects of, um, uh, of ribosomal regulation, um, so taking it from the natural to, to a more synthetic uh, situation. And, and so, as, as background, this, this diagram illustrates the flow of genetic information from the DNA to the mRNA to the protein. And our interest is in, is in translation, in the translation step. And so the, the mRNA itself, uh, as, as indicated, has a coding region. And most eukaryotic mRNAs have a single coding region that encodes one protein. Uh, on either side of the coding region are uh, typically untranslated regions, in the term of the five prime leader and the three prime untranslated region. And, and so the, the process of, of uh, you know, translating the genetic code into protein involves several steps. And, and so the, the mRNA is translated by the translation machinery. So the ribosomes in the cell uh, form a an initiation complex at a start site, which is typically AUG, which encodes methionine. Uh, once that complex is formed, the ribosome can decode the mRNA and synthesize a polypeptide chain. And at, at a certain point, there are, there are codons that specify termination. And at that point, the ribosomes can, can dissociate the, the peptide that's being synthesized is released and the RNA in the ribosomes can, can be recycled and this can happen again. So the, the actual initiation of translation, uh, can, it also involves a couple of steps. And, and so th this is a process whereby the, the small ribosomal subunit and the mRNA get together. And there are a number of different ways that, that this can happen. So 
for example, uh, one of the most common uh, mechanisms shown, shown at the top. Uh, let me, so, the, so this, this mechanism here, cap-dependent uh, mRNA translation. So uh, eukaryotic mRNAs contain a post-transcriptional modification on their mRNAs, an M7G, a methylated nucleotide called the cap structure. And this cap structure can interact with, with various proteins in the cell called initiation factors that can mediate an interaction between the mRNA and the 4DS ribosomal subunit. Now, that this, is, this is a major um, mechanism of recruitment in the cells. Uh, but recruitment can occur other ways. So there, there are a number of different mechanisms that involve um, internal initiation or cap independent initiation, in, in, translation that doesn't require the cap. And so there are specific sequences called internal ribosome entry sites, irises, that can facilitate um, the recruitment of ribosomes at sites within the message. Um, there, there are cis sequences that can, um, in some cases, interact directly with the ribosomal subunit. In some cases, so this, this is this region, and so this is demonstrating a, or illustrating a direct interaction between a cis sequence and 40S ribosomal subunit. You, you can also have indirect recruitment. Some of the uh, some of the mechanisms involve the same initiation factors that are used to recruit at the cap. They, they may involve a subset of these factors. They may involve non-canonical factors. So there there appear to be. Not, the cap independent really is, appears to be a, a very degenerate mechanism that um, allows a lot of um, diff different mechanisms to recruit the ribosome. It, it, it appears that almost any interaction between the mRNA and a uh, component of the, the translation machinery can get the ribosome to the message. In either event, if you're recruiting at the cap or if you're recruiting by cap independent mechanism, um, the, the ribosome needs to find a place to start initiating. And this is typically an AUG codon. And the, the, the recognition occurs through an initiator methionine tRNA, which base pairs to the AUG codon. So in, in, in bacteria, what happens is uh, at least in the shindo garno interaction, which is the best characterized initiation event, the, the ribosome is recruited immediately adjacent to the AUG codon. And, and so um, it, it, it's there, it's already placed there. It, it doesn't, have to, doesn't have to move anywhere. But in, in most eukaryotic mRNAs, that's not the case. Uh, the, the ribosomes are not being recruited right at the initiation codon. They, they are typically recruited uh, quite a distance upstream. It, it can be hundreds of bases, could be over a thousand bases upstream. And so the, the ribosome has to uh, get from the site of recruitment to the initiation codon. Now, how that, how that occurs uh, is still not really fully understood. There are, there are various mechanisms that have been postulated, including linear scanning and nonlinear mechanisms that involve ribosomal shunting. Now, a, a widely held model is the scanning model of ribosomal movement. And so the scanning hypothesis. So in, in this cartoon, we show um, a green ribosomal, 40S ribosomal subunit coming in at the cap and then moving to the initiator uh, start site. And, and, and so uh, the, the idea here is that the, the ribosomal subunit moves linearly along the five prime non-coding region until it encounters an AUG codon. So it's a, it's a base by base inspection. And once the first AUG codon is encountered, or at least an AUG codon that resides in what's considered a good nucleotide context, the tRNA can bind base pair and scanning stops. Once the scanning stops, the large 60S subunit comes in, forms an ADS complex, and the ribosome is then ready to start protein synthesis. So th this, the cartoon I have here is kind of illustrating initiation at the five prime ends of the message. But, it, but it's also been postulated that scanning is occurring when a ribosome is, is um, coming in at an internal point in the message, for example, at an iris.
And I think it's important to keep in mind that although the, the scanning hypothesis is consistent with the translation of some R, RNAs, it's, uh, it's, it's only uh, been supported by indirect evidence. So for example, uh, scanning ribosomes have never been visualized. There's, there's no energy source that's ever been identified for the scanning which, which would re be required to destabilize uh, RNA secondary structures. In fact, it's been shown that you can, you can move from the site of re recruitment to the initiation codon without ATP. And there are a number of observations that seem to be inconsistent with scanning. For example, not all mRNAs initiate at the first AUG codon. I think in humans, something like 40% of mRNAs uh, do not initiate at, at the first AUG codon. The initiation codon is, is not always the codon in best context. Oftentimes, the upstream AUG codons are in better nucleotide context and should, should be preferentially used. Um, in fact, in fact um, if you look at AUG distribution in, in five prime leaders, it, it appears to occur by chance. Um, and then kind of an interesting observation is that obstacles that should, should block scanning, um, for example, very stable stem loop structures, sometimes block scanning and other times have no effect at all. And a very interesting observation is that oftentimes if you have um, two AUG codons that are close to each other, they appear to compete for ribosomes. And, and for example, in a, in a very nice study in uh, it was a turn up the elbow mosaic virus. The two closely spaced AUG codons were both utilized, and many studies have shown uh, utilization of, of multiple AUG codons. But what was interesting here is that the, the, when the second AUG codon was progressively uh, spaced further from the first, the use of the first one went up, which is inconsistent with the unidirectional scanning model and suggests that the, the ribosome is sampling. And, Go to the next slide. Um, so th there are uh, shunting models or nonlinear models of, of initiation that have been suggested as well. And uh, again, the, the same sort of cartoon to try to illustrate the, the principle. The top is a is a scanning um, mechanism that is bypassing a segment of the five prime leader, and so the, the arrow is showing that it, we're, we're jumping. Uh, we're kind of jumping over a, a region of the five prime leader. Um, it, it's also been postulated that a chunting might occur without scanning at all. And, and so the, 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 second, uh, the second cartoon here kind of illustrates that where the, the ribosome is uh, kind of moving from spot to spot and you know, things such as shunt donor and acceptor sites have, have been postulated that would interact with the subunit and, and mediate this, this sort of uh, nonlinear movement. And you know, the, the, the final uh, cartoon here illustrates um, what, what might occur if you're, if you're going directly from the site of recruitment to the initiation codon without scanning or, or intermediate shunting. And, and this, this idea um, has been you know, further developed in, in some, of, uh, some of our work. And so a model that was uh, proposed by my colleagues and I, Steve Chapel and uh, the late Gerald Edelman, is the ribosomal tethering and clustering hypothesis. And, and this, this was proposed to, to try to explain the translation of uh, many of the messages that we were working on and many of the examples in the literature that seem to be completely inconsi inconsistent with scanning. And so, so the idea in a tethered complex, shown on the left here, would be that the the, in this, the way it's drawn, the, the ribosomal subunit is tethered to the cap, but this, this tethered interaction could occur at internal sites in the, in the message as well. And the, the idea is that the initiator methionine tRNA would just directly bind to an AUG codon. And so the variables that would come into play here are the distance between the, the, the ribosome and the AUG codon, the accessibility of the AUG codon. So you, you can imagine that uh, an AUG codon that might be too close to the complex might not be very efficiently used because for austeric reasons. 
And as you get further and further from the site of recruitment, initiation would be predicted to be less efficient because of the distance. You might also imagine that an AUG codon might be more accessible if it were, it might be more um, uh, likely to be used if it were more accessible. And, and so, for example, if an AUG codon was buried in secondary structure, it might not be available to base pair to the initiator tRNA. If, if an AUG codon is, is covered by a protein or a protein complex, again, it might not be uh, accessible to base pair. And, and studies from our, from our laboratory have, have uh, supported that idea. Now, the, the uh, clustering mechanism is, is, a, is a variation. It's, it's, it's a similar idea. The, the ribosome makes interactions with uh, sequence elements within the mRNA. So the, these, these are not as stable as what we predict in a, in a tether, for example, at the cap. But these are interactions that can form and, and dissociate. And so by having a more, one or more uh, mRNA elements that can mediate these types of interactions, uh, the idea is that the local concentration of the, of the ribosomal subunits would be increased. And so the, the likelihood of making an initiation event of finding an AEG codon via the tRNA would be increased in the vicinity, both upstream and downstream. And, and our experiments have suggested that that, that is the case. And, and so, so some predictions of this model are, one, that the ribosomes are, are reaching the initiation codon with, without a nucleotide by nucleotide inspection of the five prime leader. Um, the, the basic idea of both tethering and clustering is that you have an increased local concentration that increases the likelihood of an initiation event in the vicinity. And, and an important um, prediction is that initiation is not restricted to one site, but that it can occur from different sites within mRNAs, including from the coding region. And, and there, in the last two or three years or so, there, there's been a lot of data coming out that really support this idea that translation is occurring from um, multiple sites in frame and out of frame from canonical and non-canonical initiation codons. And so Promosome, a company that I, I co-founded, um, has, has used these ideas to develop two technologies that are being used to enhance protein production. One is called Rescue, which involves some recoding of the primary nucleotide sequence and TEEs, which are translation and enhancing elements. And these are, these are technologies that have been developed for increasing the production of, of, of protein drugs, for example, in a, in a bioreactor. And, and so the, the ribosomal tethering and, and clustering model uh, can account for, for numerous observations. For example, shunting, um, these ribosomal interactions with ribosomal mRNA interactions um, don't require scanning because these, these interactions can mediate different um, uh, binding events on, along the message. Um, these models um, predict the translation is going to occur uh, at different points depending on the message, depending on the, the, the distance, the structure, the RNA binding proteins, and so on. So it, it doesn't predict that translation would always occur at the first AUG going on, and it gives us an, expl an explanation why. It can explain why closely spaced AUG codons can compete with each other. And, and it can also explain why secondary structures are, are sometimes inhibitory to translation and sometimes they're not. And in fact, uh, if you look at some of that literature, but what you find is that as a stable uh, structure, like a hairpin structure, if, if it's in the middle of a, of a longer sequence, it sometimes it's completely bypassed. If it's closer to, for example, the cap structure, or if it's closer to the AUG codon, then what happens is oftentimes it is inhibitory. And, and it may be that in those cases, it's inhibitory because of, uh, of, a, of steric effects, where it's, it may be blocking uh, binding of the translation machinery or um, affecting the accessibility of, of the start site. And, and I think I've mentioned that the variables that affect 
translation, word translation is going to occur, it's going to be different in different messages, you know, depending on the sequence and the structure and, and associated factors. So now if we, if we look at if we look at ribosomes, so as I mentioned earlier, these are highly conserved through evolution. And here we have uh, bacterial and eukaryotic um, ribosomes. And, and so the, the main, the main uh, function is to catalyze peptide synthesis. In all cases, they're composed of two subunits. There's, in, in the middle here, there's a common core, so common to, to the bacterial and the eukaryotic. Um, the the RNAs in these in these subunits are shown in, in blue, and the proteins are shown in red. And and so the you, you can see that uh, the big mass of, of RNA and peppered with ribosomal proteins, and 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 so there are there are common uh, elements and there there are uh, specific elements. And so as as you kind of go up higher into the higher eukaryotes, uh, what, what becomes distinctive are um, kind of these, uh, these extensions indicated by these kind of dotted lines with, which uh, are expansion segments. And so there are segments of the ribosomal RNA that are longer in the, in the eukaryotic than in the, in the bacterial. It, I mean, they're absent in the bacterial. So for example, in the uh, mammalian 18s, I believe there's 12 expansion segments, and and so the, these are these are segments that of our ribosome RNA that are not uh, not conserved through evolution. They tend to be on the surface. They tend to be variable in length uh, in, in in different species, and and, and so as, as the ribosome has has kind of evolved, it's gotten bigger, and it, it contains more of these uh, what, what might be uh, less essential uh, uh, molecules, features. And, and so, uh, as, a, as we all know, the primary role of the ribosome is peptide synthesis. But a number of different observations suggest that they, they also can have important roles in regulating translation. And, and so, kind of going back a few years, what, what kind of got me interested in this whole area uh, were ribosomal RNA-like sequences. So at, at the time, I was working on um, cell adhesion and looking at changes in gene expression as a consequence of cell adhesion events. And what we observed was, well, one, the, the uh, cell adhesion events can affect the expression of cell adhesion molecules, which, which was interesting. But there were, there were a couple of other um, observations that and, and with uh, a little bit more looking it wasn't restricted to cell adhesion but almost every type of comparison revealed messages that had ribosomal RNA like sequences so the, these are sequence short sequence elements uh, within mRNAs that either resemble ribosomal RNA or are complementary to the ribosomal RNA and kind of a, a simple um, some kind of a you know, simple-minded idea at the time was, you know, maybe these sequences that are complementary might just base pair to ribosomes, like they do in bacteria, and sequences that resemble it might interact with ribosomal proteins, and, and that, that might be a, a mechanism of regulation as well. And um, another another thing that came out of those studies were ribosomal protein mRNAs. So under different conditions, cell adhesion and other different experimental paradigms. What you find is expression of some ribosomal protein mRNAs is enhanced and others is decreased. And it appears to be very specific. And it's different ribosomal protein mRNAs in, in, in each case. And, and so this, this kind of raised the, the idea that, well, well maybe under um, different conditions or different cell types, there's uh, the, the, the ribosome, the structure of the ribosome is, is kind of actively being remodeled and this may be this may have functional significance and I mean there, there had been a, a, hit, a kind of a literature on ribosome heterogeneity going back many years and, um, and at that time a lot of those studies were, were not taken too seriously because because of technical issues but 
I mean, the, it, it, this is a, this is something that appears to be holding up e even today, and more and more examples are coming up, uh, indicating that this is the case. And the other interesting observation was that um, specific mutations in individual ribosomal proteins um, oftentimes have very specific effects. Uh, for example. Uh, blood disorders or skeletal abnormalities um, and, and which is not like which is not exactly what you might anticipate if if it was if a mutation was having kind of a general um, inhibitory effect on on, uh, on the ribosome and so these were some, these were some interesting observations and, and so um, we, we formulated we being me and uh, the, the late Jerry Edelman formulated the ribosome filter hypothesis to try to explain some of these observations. And at the time, ribosomes really were, were kind of viewed as, uh, as tape heads that were just decoding mRNA and chugging along. And that's what they do. And that's, that's a very important function. But uh, based on some of the things I've told you and, and various observations, we postulated that um, the ribosomes also have a regulatory capacity and that this, this regulation can affect the, the expression of different mRNAs based on the ability of ribosomes to differentially interact with subsets of the mRNA population. So the, the ribosome filter hypothesis postulates that the ribosome is a regulatory element that embodies mechanisms for preferentially translating particular subsets of the message population. And, and so um, the focus of, of a lot of our work has been on interactions between the ribosomal RNA and the mRNA. And I'll, I'll discuss a, a couple of examples of that. But there, there are also uh, interactions between ribosomal or mRNAs and ribosomal proteins that, that can affect translation and, and I'll mention some examples of that as well. Um, so another uh, feature of the, of the hypothesis is that ribosomes are postulated to have a continuum of regulatory effects so some interactions are postulated to enhance translation and enhance the, the probability of an initiation event and others are, are postulated to to be inhibitory or to, to downregulate expression. The, the ability of messages and ribosomes to interact via specific binding sites suggests that different RNAs may compete for binding to those sites. And so there, there may be effects um, caused by, by this competition. And we postulated that one, one way to modulate the, the filter is to, is to uh, um, to have situations in which the the uh, particular binding sites are altered in accessibility, they could be masked. Um, ribosomal RNA, there are variants of ribosomal RNA. There are uh, differences in ribosomal protein composition that could enable certain sites to binding sites to be present or absent, either in the ribosomal protein or in the ribosomal RNA itself by masking or or allowing sequences to be accessible. And as well as uh, other, other proteins or RNAs that might interact with subunits and, and affect potential or particular binding sites. And so, so this, this is a cartoon that tries to illustrate um, the, 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 the notion of um, how ribosomes that, are, that differ in protein or RNA or uh, in the presence or absence of different binding sites might differentially affect translation of, of messages. And so the, uh, the top, uh, the, these, these circles are supposed to be ribosomes. And, and so there's a, there's a green and red bar in ribosome A. And, and the, these, are, these would be uh, binding sites. The green represents a binding site that would, uh, would enhance translation. The red indicates a binding site that would inhibit the translation. And, and so in A, the, both of these binding sites are, are present and accessible. In subunit B, the, the green, the, the positive binding site is present. The other site is, is, is absent or it's being masked. 
um, in C, it's, it's the, the negative site that's absent or masked and the, the, uh, the green site that is present. And so if you have a mRNA population that varies in its cis sequences, a, a message like number one um, doesn't contain any specific cis elements that uh, allow differential binding to the ribosomal subunits. And so you would expect that this message would be translated with equal efficiency by all three types of, of ribosomes. The message like number two, which contains the binding site for the positive site in the ribosome, the green, green, you would expect the translation could be enhanced in by um, ribosome A and B, but it wouldn't be by, by the third ribosome, which, which doesn't have that site accessible or available. A third message with a binding site for a negative element in the ribosome would, would be down-regulated by ribosomes A and C, but, but not by B. And, and so, as I mentioned, we, we've uh, spent a bit of time looking at ribosome RNA interactions. And, and so kind of the, the first example, the first real example of this was the Sandow-Garnow interaction in, in E. coli. And, and so th this, was, this was named after the scientists who, who identified this sequence, um, John Shine, Lynn Delgarno. And, and so in, in this interaction, there, there's um, a purine-rich sequence, the Sandow-Garnow sequence, that's loaded, located upstream of the initiation codon, the, the methionine initiation codon, the AEG. And this, this sequence can base pair to the ribosome, to the small ribosomal subunit, to the three prime end of the 16S ribosomal RNA, which contains a complementary permitting rich sequence. And, and so th this interaction, this sequence, allows the message to bind to the ribosome and to initiate translation efficiently. And so mutations in the Shandogarno sequence disrupt the binding, so the ribosome doesn't bind to the message, and also disrupts the translation. Now, the way they established that this was a real interaction, a real base pairing interaction, was by showing that mutations of the Shandogarno sequence, which disrupted binding and disrupted translation, could function to enhance translation if the 16S ribosome RNA was mutated in a compensatory way so that it, it could now base pair to the mutated sequence. And, and so by, uh, by performing uh, these kinds of compensating mutations, um, they provided, it was Hugh, Hugh and DeBoer who provided very strong evidence that this type of a base pairing interaction was actually occurring. And so for a long time, it, it, was, it was thought that uh, the, these types of base pairing interactions were restricted to bacteria. But we had seen many examples of many mRNAs that, that contain these types of sequences. And, and so we, um, we investigated a little bit further. And, and so one of the first messages, in fact, not one of the first, but one of the messages that we uh, studied kind of the most intensively uh, comes from the GTA, GTX homeo domain mRNA. This is a sequence that we had identified, a complementary sequence match to the 18S ribosome RNA, so the, the RNA component of the small 40S ribosomal subunit in, in mammalian cells. And what we did was we, we showed that this five prime leader, uh, the five prime leader of the, of the GTX mRNA could function as an internal ribosome entry site. We, we tried to define the boundaries of this iris, but we found that we, we weren't actually able to do that. Um, it turned out that the, the five prime leader had a modular composition and the different, uh, different segments of this five prime leader could function independently to, to enhance translation to function as, as iris elements. And so the, the, the one iris element that was complementary to the ribosome RNA is, is shown, shown here so that we showed that this particular sequence could function independently as an internal ribosome entry site. But we also showed that it, it could enhance translation in the context of a capped mRNA, so above the level of the cap. And so that we then termed it a, a translation enhancing element, or a TEE. 
And we were able to show that by linking together multiple copies of this um, particular element, uh, we were able to dramatically enhance protein synthesis, which, which uh, formed the base, some of the thinking behind kind of the clustering um, mechanism of, of, of initiation. And, and so the, the sorts of, the sorts of uh, studies we, we performed with, with the GTX um, involved um, every, everything from binding to uh, just manipulation of the sequence to genetic studies. And, and so uh, we, sh we showed that the degree of complementarity in this message was correlated with activity. And so maximal activity was, was able to be achieved with seven nucleotides. Um, if, the complementary match was longer or, or shorter, the activity progressively fell off. And, um, and that, that's consistent with the idea that um, if, if you have too stable an interaction, you may sequester and, and, and be inefficient at translation. And, and if it's too short, you just are not efficient at recruiting. And th these, uh, that correlation was, was supported by binding assays um, where we showed that as, as the complementary match became longer, it actually bounced the subunits more strongly, supporting the, the idea that the longer um, interactions might be uh, too stable. Um, using different approaches, we were able to localize the complementary match, which found in the, in the, the platform of the, of the small subunit. Um, so it, it's locations comparable to the region um, of the, of the anti-Shindergarno sequence in bacteria. And, and to, to really determine whether this was a base pairing interaction, we, we wanted some genetic evidence of a type uh, performed in E. coli. And, and at the time, there, there wasn't a suitable mammalian system available for performing these studies. And so we performed uh, studies in yeast. And, and so in the yeast, the, the, the comparable region of the yeast ribosome uh, did not have a com the same complementary match to the GTX element. And we found that the GTX element was inactive in yeast. Or we found that if, if we introduced a complementary match into the yeast 18S ribosomal RNA, we could, uh, we could obtain activity. And we did this in, 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 in several different ways. Um, we, we also showed that mutations that disrupted the GTX sequence disrupted activity but we were able to restore activity by introducing the com compensating mutation into the ribosomal RNA. And so I think we did this five times, five different, and so five different sequence elements that no longer functioned with the wild type ribosome, only functioned with the specifically mutated ribosome. And, and so th this, this provided evidence that uh, it, it, the GTX was interacting by a base pairing mechanism. So a more recent example that we've worked on is, is the uh, uh, HCV or hepatitis C. And so this, this, uh, this virus has an RNA genome that's uncapped and single-stranded. It's a major cause of severe liver disease. And, and it expresses a single long polypeptide that then gets processed into, into the proteins that the, that the virus needs. And, and this, this RNA contains an iris, and this iris is, is kind of special. It can directly bind to the 40S ribosomal subunit. It's an uncapped RNA. It doesn't require the cap binding complex to, to recruit the ribosome. Some earlier studies had shown that it does require an interaction with uh, a ribosomal protein in the, in the subunit, S25. And other studies have shown that this iris can involve the EIF3 complex of initiation factors, but, um, but it is a direct binding mechanism. And the, the iris can then uh, facilitate initiation in the presence of the initiator tRNA, which comes along with the, with the ternary complex. And, and so um, some, some earlier studies have shown that um, the, the iris interacts with, with the, the, the different components of the ribosomal uh, subunit. And an interaction with the 18S ribosomal RNA was, was shown. And, and so this, this figure uh, kind of illustrates the, the, 
the, the sequences, the nucleotides that are binding in the 18S ribosome RNA and in the HCV iris. And so there's there's you know, three bases, CCC in the, R, in the ribosome RNA and GGG in the binding. So it's very short. I mean, by itself, uh, would, would not be capable of, of recruiting the, uh, the the ribosome, and um, you know, so so there there's no functional evidence that there was a real base pair interaction. There there was there was evidence that this was an important interaction. Mutations, for example, of of the uh, the, of the binding site in the HCV iris disrupted activity, disrupted binding to, to, the, to the ribosome. The binding um, uh, was shown to protect the nucleotides, these the CCC, GGG nucleotides. And, and, and so there, there was evidence that these se sequences bind and that the binding is important. Um, what was missing was evidence that it was actually base pairing. And because you, you can imagine that mutations of the iris could, could disrupt the iris by some other mechanism. And, and so to, to do this analysis, we, we used a, uh, an 18S RNA expression system that we had developed earlier. And, and so this is a mammalian expression system. It, uh, it, it has, we had used the yeast expression system earlier um, for the GTX analysis. This one has an advantage because it, it has a, a mutation that confers resistance to the uh, antibiotic pactomycin. And, and so what this enables you to do is um, express a mutated ribosome RNA and in the presence of the antibiotic, which is, is very permeable, this, uh, this particular antibiotic, you're, you're able to uh, disrupt the translation from the wild type uh, ribosomal subunits and, and monitor expression from the, the recombinant 18S are subunits containing the, the recombinant 18S RNAs. And then this is a nice system because it, it also allows you to look at mutations that, that might be lethal if, if, the, if the cell had to uh, uh, survive using those ribosomes. And so this, um, this schematic shows what the synthetic RNA looks like. It, it contains, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a mutation that confers pactomycin resistance. It also it also has a, a hybridization tag. So this is a sequence that we introduced into the into the ribosome RNA to enable us to differentiate between ribosomes that contain the wild type and the recombinant 18S RNA. The 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 construct at the bottom here um, is is what we used for for much of the analysis of the HCV. And it, it contains a CMV promoter driving expression of a dicestronic mRNA. So this, this mRNA expresses uh, renal luciferase by a cap-dependent mechanism. It also expresses the firefly photinous luciferase by an iris-dependent mechanism. And the, the iris is located between the two cistrons, so in the intercistronic space. And so the, the expression of the, the photinous luciferase depends on the HCV iris. And so the, the first thing we, we did was um, we tried to establish that the, the recombinant 18S ribosome RNA um, could translate from the HCV iris so that the, uh, the iris could direct translation through these recombinant ribosomes. And, and so we, we performed an experiment. You, you can see here that um, the construct containing the wild type is expressed at a fairly good level compared to MSC, which is a multiple cloning site, so that's the control. So it's about a tenfold difference. Uh, now, individual point mutations in the, the binding site, the GGG, so G to C mutations, all disrupted the activity. They, they disrupted the activity to, to a level approximately the same as that of another mutation, this U228C, which um, was previously shown to disrupt activity to about the same extent as mutations of the, of the GGG sequence. So this suggested that at least our experimental system was, was uh, viable. Um, and, and so the, ne the next thing we did was to, to mutate the, um, 
the complementary binding site in the 18S ribosomal RNA, uh, the CCC sequence. And, and so here we've introduced point mutations. We've also, we also mutated uh, the, the, U before, the U before the CCC because uh, there, there was some evidence that that, that sequence was, was also protected upon binding of the, of the iris to the, to the ribosome. And so we, we have four different mutations. And in each case, these mutations disrupt the activity of the, of the iris compared to the wild type uh, 18S ribosome RNA. Now to, sh to show that this decrease in expression was not simply due to a disruption in ribosomal function, just a poorly functioning ribosome or poorly uh, assembled subunit, we, we tested other uh, sequences. So we, we tested the polio virus iris, and, and you can see that it's, it's translated with about the same, same efficiency by the wild type and by the mutated variants of, of the 18S ribosome RNA. Same, same with the uh, encephalomyocarditis virus iris, cricket paralysis virus iris. The, the intercystronic region, just the background levels um, with the multiple cloning site were unaffected. Same with, we, we put a beta globin 5 prime leader in the intercystronic region. And cap-dependent translation as monitored by um, the, the expression of Renella luciferase, which, which would be cap-dependent, appeared to be unaffected by, by these mutations, suggesting that the, the, the ribosomes are, are functioning properly and uh, the effects that we had seen on the, on the last slide um, were, were specific. Um, now to, to take it one step further and establish the base pairing, we, we generated a, a series of 18S ribosome RNA constructs mutated in the complementary, in the binding site, in the complementary region at one, two, or, or three nucleotides. And, and so these are, these are indicated here, you know, M1 to M9. Now, if you, if you look at the, uh, the expression data, the, all of these mutations result in an in, in inability of the subunits that contain them to translate from the HCV iris. And so, so then what we did was we introduced point mutations into the iris itself to compensate for one of these mutations. And so, for example, here, HCV M1. So the, comp the compensating um, 18S ribosome RNA is this one in orange, this M2. And so you can see that when a ribosome containing that point mutation is, is used to translate the HCV iris that contains this mutation, there is expression. In fact, slightly better than the wild type, whereas the wild type and the other mutated ribosomes don't translate that message. Uh, similarly, we, we uh, were, were able to compensate other point mutations in the HCV iris. We were able to compensate um, mutations in the, in the GGG sequence, so the GGG CCC base pairing region. We were not able to, to compensate uh, the uh, mutations of, of the U. Um, and, and so interesting that uh, these these alternative uh, base pairing combinations are actually more active than the than the wild type sequence, suggesting that, that the 18S, the, the wild type sequence, is somehow constraining the, the activity of this of this iris. Um, so, uh, so these, these experiments um, strongly indicate that the the HCV iris requires a base pairing interaction with the 18S ribosome RNA for its activity. Now we know that it, it's, it also requires ribosomal protein S25 or other interactions. And so, so this, this is a kind of a nice and interesting example because it, it, uh, it shows an element that uh, by itself would, would not be capable of recruiting the ribosome, but functions as part of a, of a multi-interaction uh, 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 Event which, which which facilitates the the activity, which if you, if you think about it, really kind of broadens the, the potential scope of these sorts of interactions and, and their their significance. Um, so I mean there there are a lot of other examples. That, recently, there's quite a few papers that have been coming out 
which support the, the uh, notion of ribosomal regulation. Uh, I'm not going to review them. Uh, I'll just point out a few that uh, have some interesting uh, features. Um, so there was a study this year from uh, Schlosserer and, and colleagues, and, and what they showed that was that um, methylation of the ribosomal RNA of one nucleotide, and this is in the yeast 25S, which is the kind of the major RNA component of the, the large ribosomal subunit, can have differential effects on translation. So whether the, the, the ribosome has this methylation event or not um, can affect the translation of a subset of, of the mRNA, which is very interesting. So it's very interesting in that th this is uh, affecting translation through the large ribosomal subunit. Another example through the large ribosomal subunit um, has to do with translation of some Hox mRNAs, which uh, which can function as iris elements, and they can affect translation of these genes, which have very important uh, functions in development, and and appear to be mediated by an interaction with ribosomal protein L38. Again, large ribosomal subunit, which which is which is very interesting. Um, another, the last example I, I want to mention is. is um, the study it actually came out from uh, Lee and Weissman in, in 2012. And this is a very interesting example. It's an E. coli, um, but it but it shows that uh, mRNA ribosomal RNA interaction can, can mediate ribosomal pausing, and this is during elongation, right? And so, what they found is that the major pause site in E. coli is basically the sign of Arnold interaction. And so, so that, that same sort of interaction between the mRNA and the ribosome can stall ribosomes. And, and they did some very convincing study, studies using orthogonal ribosomes to show that, that this is the case. And, and I think this is very interesting because it, it um, kind of extends the, the, uh, the notion of ribosomal regulation from being restricted to initiation to also being um, an important potentially important um, uh, regulator during elongation. And pausing is important for uh, protein folding, for example. And so ju just, just to kind of, kind of end, uh, I think we're running out of time. Um, so so the, the, this notion of ribosomal regulation and the sorts of studies that have been done suggest that um, d different modifications of the ribosome can have specific effects on, on mRNA translation. And it shows that the, the ribosome is, is modifiable at various points. And so this kind of raises the possibility if we, if we kind of take a step beyond what's natural and um, you know, can we, can we uh, begin to uh, modify the ribosome for, for other functions or ex enhancing certain functions. And, and so um, we can imagine that a good way to go about doing this might be to, to start looking at the expansion segments. As I mentioned earlier, these are highly variable regions of the ribosome RNA. They tend to be located on the surface outside of um, kind of a, the core regions. Uh, in, at least in bacteria, they, they seem to be tolerant to insertion. Uh, or some of our own preliminary studies suggest that you, you can actually get rid of some of the expansion segments without um, significantly affecting ribosomal function. And, and so the, these, these sequences uh, provide an opportunity perhaps to introduce different sorts of RNA cargos into, into ribosomes. And uh, there's a, uh, kind of a thing that should be kept in mind is that you, can, you, you might be able to um, do something fairly significant using this approach because ribosome RNAs are, are amongst the most abundant RNAs in cells. And, and I, th I think that's, that's well, a few concluding remarks. Um, and, and so um, what, I've, what I've talked to you about today is you know, the role of ribosomes kind of one step beyond protein synthesis, kind of their regulatory, their potential regulatory roles, examples where they do appear to affect translation of specific mRNAs. And what's interesting is uh, we, we had initially uh, predicted that most of the uh, uh, regulatory effects would be through the small subunit. We, we, we thought that it could occur through the large as well. 
but it, it looks like examples are coming in uh, with both large and small, and so it's 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 nice to see that, uh, that both subunits are, are affecting um, uh, translation. It'd be interesting to um, to understand more how how these interactions with the large subunit are mediating their effects. Um, so the the regulation itself appears to be mediated both by interactions with ribosomal RNA and with ribosomal proteins. Uh, so something I didn't bring up, but a potential complication with the ribosomal proteins is that a lot of them have um, uh, extra ribosomal functions. So a lot of them are found outside of ribosomes, and and can do things outside of ribosomes. And so that, that makes that makes the analysis of those sorts of interactions just a little bit more more complicated. Uh, but in fact, some recent studies are are, are, are getting around that. Um, and, and I think the final step, which I think is very important, is that uh, there's now evidence that um, ribo ribosomes can regulate both initiation and at the elongation steps of, of translation, at least, at least in E. coli. And um, uh, different parts of this work were, were funded through the NIH and uh, through funding arrangements with uh, with Promosome. And um, I think we can look for some questions. Let's see. So there's a there's a question from John Plant. Uh, does pH level in cells have an impact on how a ribosome will work? Um, I don't know. I mean, I it's a, it's a good question, but I, I I don't have a good answer. And um, you know, Curious why? Curious why? Why you're thinking along that line? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, here. There's a few others. Um, uh, Iram Nasir, uh, the GTX 18S base pairing is a conserved. Um, no, it's, it, no, that that particular. Sequence is not conserved. As a, in, fact, in fact, that's one of the reasons we were able to perform the the study in uh, in yeast is, is is because that sequence wasn't wasn't contained in in the yeast uh, in the yeast system. Um, the what, what comes to play in, in different organisms as well is the the stability of different mRNA ribosome RNA based pairing interactions with with the um, um, the HCV virus, for example, um, the uh, there are GU interactions that are thought to um, uh, enable the the virus to work with uh, yeast ribosomes. Um, when we did experiments introducing U's, the, the, they weren't functional, and, um, and we we think we think some of that might have to do with. Uh, um, Temperature differences. Um, have T Brian Ho uh, have T's been developed defined for plant expression systems? Um, uh, not that I know. We have we have not done that. Um, and uh, you know, although although we what we have done is uh, uh, Many of these many of these TEEs were initially initially identified in our studies from um, in yeast, and and um, we, what we noticed is a quite a few of them were complementary to different different regions in the um, in the 18S ribosome RNA, and uh, in in some cases we were able to uh, get elements that could function in mammalian cells by uh, by making sequences complementary to these same regions in the mammalian 18S ribosomal RNAs, um, so, so a sequence that would function in yeast didn't function in the mammalian, but it, it would function when it was complementary. We, we haven't done this with, with plants, um, but I, I would imagine that a similar approach would would, would be functional. Okay, so let's see. Um, Christine uh, Atkinson, does does pausing indicate further control? That, oh, uh, okay, here. Does pausing indicate further control than simply on-off 
and match. I think, well, I th I th I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, I, I, I think it, it, the, the pausing indicates that uh, this is an this is a this is a, an event that is occurring during the elongation during the actual peptide synthesis to slow the ribosome at a certain point. It's known that um, at certain points you, you often have to pause in order to to have a the correct folding of a of a protein. This this uh, this sort of interaction is I think it's significant for a num for a number of reasons. Uh, one of one of which is that um, it, it, it illustrates a uh, kind of another level of of information that's encoded in the coding region of, of mRNAs. And, and for example, um, uh, kind of a common approach that's used to enhance uh, protein expression involves codon optimization. So you, you, you change the codon usage to try to facilitate protein synthesis. And it often involves getting rid of rare codons and, and things of that nature or harmonizing, harmonizing codon usage from one organism to another. But, but when you do that, you, so then this is all done using synonymous codon changes. When you do that, this sort of information that might be encoded in, in the in the primary sequence, these, these sorts of, uh, for example, uh, a stretch of nucleotides that may mediate an, a base bearing interaction with the ribosome is disrupted, right? And, and so you, you could imagine that uh, expressing that sort of an RNA, uh, uh, it's codon optimized, the, you may get a different uh, folding pattern in, in that particular study. They were able to show that the, the absence of the anti chandelier sequence in uh, in the ribosome um, disrupted that, the, the normal pausing uh, pattern. Uh, I think that, that might be it. Uh, Have, if there are any more questions, uh, you can please send them in and um, I'll try to answer them. I believe that uh, if uh, if there are other questions later on, we, we can uh, you, you can submit those and uh, I'll, I'll try to get back to you uh, through email. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 14th, 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>